You're listening to Modern Intimacy, a show about mental health, sex, relationships, and the private things we need to talk about more publicly. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri. As a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and packed trained couples therapist, I help people live more fulfilled lives by shattering stigma, erasing shame, and building connections. It's no secret that we live in a society that compartmentalizes mental health and sex from our everyday lives. On this show, we're going to change that, and we'll do it by getting curious together. In this podcast, I'll invite you to join me as I investigate the relationship between sex, mental health, relationships, and modern society. In each episode, it's my goal to provide safe, smart, dimensional, and practical answers to those complex questions you've been wondering about. Head on over to modernintimacy.com slash podcast for show notes and resources, or to submit a question or topic you'd like me to explore in future episodes, as well as to find all the links to follow us on your favorite podcast apps so you don't miss an episode. Don't forget to follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Dr. Kate Balistrieri for daily tips on how to improve your mental health, sex, and relationships. Everyone has questions. You are not alone. On this show, I make information accessible because everyone deserves to have more integrated, healthy, and sexually satisfying relationships. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. In this episode, I'll be discussing the male gaze. Is it hot or is it hurtful? With special guest William Batiste. I saw a video on William's account, and this is what really sparked my interest in having him as a guest. William mentioned in his video about how damaging the male gaze and its over portrayal in film, cinema, TV, and commercials can be on the expectations of men in the dating world. This is a really interesting perspective because most of the time the male gaze is talked about as being damaging to women. Now the male gaze is language that originally came about in 1973 by Laura Mulvey, and she coined the term male gaze talking about, and Laura was a filmmaker and theorist, and she coined the term male gaze to talk about what she understood to be the way in which female characters were portrayed on screen. And what she observed, I'll try to do it justice because her paper is really in depth and I recommend you check it out even though it's about 50 years old. Um, But the, the lens certainly applies today And we can learn a lot from that essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. I'll keep a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to check it out. So in her paper, she essentially outlines a couple of different ways in which the male gaze is portrayed in cinema. And what she recognized was how two things, how characters were depicted and the female characters, as she observed, were depicted in a way that satisfied the desires or the interests or the fantasies of the male characters in the show. And it was their secondary development that was so interesting to her to point out. So even if the characters had their own unique goals, uh, personality traits and characteristics, their own vision, their own wants, their own needs, so much of how they were portrayed in the film was catered through the eyes of the male characters around them. And typically that was um, an erotic or a sexualized object. So in other words, the women, no matter how dynamic they were on their own, were objectified in a way that catered to male interests, heterosexual, heteronormative male interests. The second phenomenon that she highlighted in her essay and in all of her examination of the way men and women were portrayed in film was to look at the cinematography and the ways in which the cameras actually focused on women and used the camera angles, the different effects, and of course, the costume design and um, the set design to really focus on the sexual features of female characters. So it's from this lens that William and I will be talking about the male gaze and really asking the questions, is it hot or is it hurtful and to whom? So before we jump in and invite William to talk with us today, let's look at the TikTok video of his that I saw that sparked my invitation to him to be on this podcast. It's such a 
quick video and so informative in such a short amount of time. Here it is. How the male gaze ruins men's love lives. The male gaze is the act of depicting women in media from a male perspective that presents women as object-like characters. This can be seen by treating women characters as a reward for the man for accomplishing his goal. How this affects men is that the concept of female attraction is written completely from a male perspective which makes men think that acting like main characters in movies will make women attracted to them. But this perspective is usually completely divorced from how women actually experience attraction, which leads to many young men feeling disillusioned with romance because the women in real life aren't acting how male writers in Hollywood told them they would be. Okay, now that you've seen the video, let me tell you a little bit about William. William Petit III has been published in Time, Huffington Post, and Inc. Magazine. He's a TEDx speaker, Quora top writer, and has over 160,000 followers on TikTok. William received his Juris Doctorate from Illinois Tech and has degrees in both philosophy and history from Baylor University. William lives in New York, where he has performed as a comedian alongside Bill Burr and Tracy Morgan. Well, thank you so much, William, for joining me today. Um, I wonder if you can tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much for having me. And um, uh, my name is William Batiste. I am a stand-up comic and lawyer by trade, but I don't practice. Um, I am from London, but I was raised in Hong Kong um, and then moved to Texas. Uh, right now, I have multiple courses on frame control and uh, digital products in that space. Right now, I just I enjoy making TikToks and making philosophy videos, and I'm currently working on a book called The Holocron about the phenomenology of identity and how that operates within understanding ourself. And so, yeah, and I'm so happy to be on this podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, joining, for joining me here today. I really would love for you to kind of share what inspired you to make that TikTok. So part of it, what, part of what inspired me to make that TikTok was the fact that I felt like I'd been duped as a young mm. guy. And I felt like it had led to a lot of um, resentment towards women when I was younger because they weren't acting in the way in which that movies were telling me they would. And I would say, well, Michael Sarah got a girlfriend. Why can't I? He did the exact same things that I was doing. And I didn't realize that these people who are writing movies are trying to work through their own trauma. So when I was going through my 20s and I was a dating coach for a bit and understanding like, oh, a lot of the things that I thought were really relevant to women are actually mm -hmm. just really relevant to men. And they think that's what women want. And, Can you give an example of that? Uh, for example, muscles, mm -hmm. um, like getting very muscular. Um, so I work out a lot and I remember it's not that girl or the women I dated didn't like it. It was one of the girls I dated said, it's like a seat warmer in a car. You're never mm -hmm. going to buy a car because of the seat warmer, but once you have it in your car, you're really happy with it. Right. And um, so, <laughs> and so that was, that was one of the, the other things is just like the wanton hypermasculinity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're just like, oh, like I'm going to shoot guns or I'm going to have fish. You see it in like Tinder dating profiles, just men misunderstanding um, something and then getting upset. And so I just kept noticing this thing when I hear complaints from guys like, well, why isn't she like this? And it's like, well, women have never been like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you want her to be like the heiress and hitch mm -hmm. <laughs> he's gonna pick a guy and that that's not how it operates and then it oscillates to two vastly different extremes where it's like oh women would just they just care about what's on the inside you know they don't care about the looks or it goes to the other side where it's like oh women are just vapid right mm -hmm. and if you stand by a lamborghini all these women are going to want you and um and i think that that causes a lot of guys to have just one wrong assumptions with, about women some of this resentment and pain that you feel that the world doesn't make sense well that's because the world was written to you by people who don't have an all-encompassing understanding are more ideologically programmed than we think we are let's look at another one of your tiktoks to get a deeper understanding of what you mean life lessons from art romantic comedies hollywood does its best to make you forget that someone wrote the love story unfolding in front of you and even though you intellectually know that a person wrote the movie, you forget that they are a person trying to sublimate their pain through their art. We are aware of this with musicians, but forget with screenwriters. But what makes cinema different than music is that cinema doesn't give you what you desire. It tells you what to desire. Ever wonder why we're all chasing the same relationship aesthetic? 
And sure, we all say movies create false expectations for relationships, but that doesn't stop us from silently having those expectations for our own love lives. Never forget that behind almost every happily ever after is a person who wrote the story of the relationship they always wanted but never got. We don't even realize the cauldron of hot water that we're that we're swimming in right now when it comes to the misattunements and misinterpretations around like what people really want and how to go about getting that um, in a relationship. So often, and I'm really glad you brought up the um, the point about sort of fish in dating profiles. It's one of the complaints that I hear most from the the women that I work with. Um, in their dating lives. And, and they'll frequently, frequently say, nobody cares about your fish. Why are you posting this fish? And similarly, many of the men that I work with will say things like, I just don't understand why my profile isn't impressive. See all these great things that I can do and that I have done. And so it seems like there's a real mismatch with intention and, and reception because there are a lot of stereotypes that get perpetuated in the media and on TV and in the cinema um, and certainly this concept of the male gaze and catering to it has been, you know, really unhelpful for people of all genders. Most definitely. And it's funny that you talk about um, those guys, because I think part of um, like a lot of people think people become dating coaches because, oh, you've always been good with women. But that's actually no, you, you, those are the worst dating coaches because they don't understand all the things that were going wrong. And so when I got into that space, and there's a lot of terrible things about it, but there was also things where it was like, look, like women aren't obligated to care about what you care about. People who are the most in pain are actually not bad guys at yeah. all. They're mm -hmm. guys who are every dude's best friend who will go out and beyond for people. And it's not like this caricature of a nice guy we're talking about it. These people are just generally disposed to being this way, but they are so used to dialogue with men, which is basically, oh, relieving tension because you don't want to get in a fight, being funny, um, competency, these are all attractive qualities of a human being, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in the role of attraction. And I think that so much about attraction is implicit. So it is hard to describe. So whenever you have a, a woman trying to describe what she wants, then guys gaslight her as being like, oh, you want it like this one way, but then, and not taking in consideration, well, having someone with social acuity to be able to provide the emotional experience that I want in that moment mm -hmm. varies based on context and setting. But in movies, let's say James Bond, James Bond is always the same, mm -hmm. right? And so you have a lot of guys, one of the things that we say whenever we take guys on a boot camp is like, you're not James Bond. No one cares about you. Why are you standing here in the club trying to have people gravitate towards you? That's not how reality <laughs> operates, right? right? But you watch so many movies of guys being cool and women throwing themselves at them. You kind of think like, well, if I want to get James Bond the results, I just have to act like James Bond, leaving out the fact that it's a movie, number one, it's written by a man, and he's hyper-competent. He, th th there's all these other settings that people aren't considering. And then so they're mm -hmm. like, what, I'm going out, but no one's coming up and talking to me. And it's like, yeah, you're not a main character in the movie. And you know, there's this whole Gen Z thing, which is be the main character. And I understand it, but I think that that is not the way to approach success in any environment. Um, well, we, can, we can't all be the main character. So if everybody's trying to jockey to be the main character, then guess what? We're just all a bunch of bozos on the same bus doing the same thing anyway. So it, it's really um, disheartening when, when somebody has that idea of how they should be in the dating world and then find themselves really without any of the same fruitfulness of the efforts they see on TV. And because also people don't have to live with the consequences of their actions as main character. Right. 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 And so there's two things that really bother me that that are kind of like fossilized online to get good with women. It's like one is be the main character and the other one is stop caring. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that it's a very immature mindset, because what ends up happening is if you don't care about what other people think, if you're not getting if you're not um, you're not aware of these things, you're going to hit walls mm -hmm. in, in, in your relationships and you're not going to understand why, because, yeah, maybe that boldness can be interpreted in a certain context as, oh, this is very attractive. Mm -hmm. But then over time, it gets old because it's the same thing. Right. And um, what I always tell people whenever they're talking about being a main character is like, that's the delusion. That's the, that's the illusion of our experience. The reality is, is that everybody's experience is as deep and robust as our own. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And the more you understand the weights and the nuances of those experiences within other people, the more you can provide them with experiences that they want to experience in the romantic realm. But that's not what ever happens within movies. It's just the guy being like, oh, I got better at sports and I ran a marathon and then she fell in love with me. <laughs> you know, and, and, like, like, and the thing is, is that there's survivorship bias. So there's enough guys to where that does happen. But right. you have to also look at how you are both the same and dissimilar to people with these success stories. Mm -hmm. um, you are just like elucidating the point so well. So thank you for that. And I think it's it's an interesting maybe step back to talk about what exactly is the male gaze? How would people know that they're seeing it in, in action? How would you describe so, it? And, and for this is a very rudimentary understanding. And there are lots of feminist philosophers that, that do talk about this in mm -hmm. more depth. Um, I, it's basically in media, in art, it's the depiction of women from a strictly male perspective. Mm -hmm. causes the viewer, both men and women, to in some senses dehumanize women because right. it's a perspective of not, not understanding and at worst objectification, mm -hmm. right? A woman only existing within a, a movie or a piece of art as a trophy to be won to fulfill some rite of passage for the man and this is perpetuated in all mediums not just in cinema but it's most i think um when we take a look at the ideology manufacturer it's cinema for us and i think that mm -hmm. it sets up a lot of our implicit standards for who a human being is supposed to be and i think what's most painful about it too is that women begin seeing themselves through that prism as this is the only way that they are able to communicate value mm -hmm. or have valuable parts of themselves that are just not valued by men um, or other women because it exists outside of the space of what a woman is supposed to be. And, you know, you see different incarnations of this with like manic picture dream girls or trophy wives, or, you know, there are all these tropes or the semiotics that communicate like this is this type of woman and she is going to be tamed. And then she's going to choose this guy mm. because he was very competent and he almost sacrificed himself for the girl. A lot of people ridicule um, the 9-11 guys because they were going to do it for 72 virgins, right? That's mm -hmm. the, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, what do you what do you call girls like a guy in uniform? That's our own rendition of that same myth, mm. right? right? You, women want a man who sacrifices himself. So it also kind of sets up men mm -hmm. to view their lives as kind of, you know, I remember thinking that I, this is such a strange thought. When I, I used to fantasize about dying for women. Hmm. As, as, as in, in the same like, way in that you would die for women, you would die and then there would be a plethora of women available to you in the afterlife? Not in that way. Okay. In, in that I would die being a hero. Ah, okay. For a, a woman that I had a crush on. Sure. And that persisted into deep college, mm. right? And, and I, the, the fantasies were like, oh, there'd be like somebody robbing the gas station and I would jump in. The and this is not a normal thought. Mm. This is, the, but this is kind of like, oh, how in guy's concept, how can I be valued? How can I show a woman I'm valuable? I will die for her, which mm. is so divorced from real, no girl wants you to die for her. Like that's right. not, but that's that entire theater of that experience mm -hmm. um, was born out of movies, was born out of Bruce Willis being my favorite actor and Die Hard and all these other things, even though his wife wasn't, his wife didn't play really much of a role besides the incentive of him to continue to try and save people. Mm -hmm. Like he was willing to sacrifice himself for her. And you just see this time and time again. You do, and, and you bring up such an interesting, um sort of point about how masculinity is often defined, right? And masculinity in, in some of its more dangerous ways can be defined as it, you're only as good and as manly and as worthy as your most um, adept perfunctory capabilities, right? So a lot of focus on being a human doing as opposed to being a human being. And sitting in that sort of space of I'm not good enough unless I can make a lot of money or fall on my sword and save the damsel in distress or, or the um, weaker person who might be injured. Um, you know, I have to do all of these things in order to earn my masculinity, not even just earn love, but 
earn my identity as a man. And I think that's one of the biggest sort of insidious uh, implications of the male gaze is that it does create this sort of bifurcated experience for men of, I either have to be hyper competent, charismatic, James Bondy, infallible, right? Or sort of the, the bumbly character from Hitch and nervous and super sweet and therefore doesn't have all of those hyper masculine characteristics, but has such a good heart, but nobody will see him. And so it's like this really interesting, who am I? How do I be a man? And what kind of relational security will that offer me? A million, million percent. And I think that's one of the big problems that we're having is, is that I, so I believe in doing um, a genealogy on concepts of masculinity. Masculinity exists for men to believe that they're expendable. Mm. Um, women are far more important to a civilization to than um, men, mm. just in terms of, um, so in World War II, nine out of every, I think, well, Russian men die. Wow. Um, and their population bounced back within one generation. If the same amount of women had died of the population had been flipped, they still their population still would not have recovered and likely they would have completely imploded. And so there is there is an understanding that a, a man is as useful in a lot of history if he's willing to go out and die for his country. And mm -hmm. and how you're going to be rewarded for this is you might be blessed with the opportunity of being able to reproduce. And so, and so women have been used as that a chip that they offer. And you look at it even in American World War II stuff. I did an entire um, video on this where I, because I have suffered from the tyranny of masculinity. Mm -hmm. I think that so masculinity does not serve us in this space. I number one, we look at masculine being masculine as a trait rather than a mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. There are times where it is good for me to perform as being masculine. But if I always have to perform as being masculine, I will shackle myself to just a limited amount of opportunity, mm -hmm. tons of negative emotions for a lot of different people, mm -hmm. and honestly, not let parts of, out of my, myself that are really valuable. Mm -hmm. But because we have made it this chip that number one, isn't yours, and this is the way male gaze affects men is so, is in the audience of a person's mind is a greater man, maybe their father, their brother, somebody in their fraternity that says, you're not a real man unless you do this. Mm. And that is the gaze. So a lot of, in my book, The Holocron, what I'm writing about is that the phenomenological experience of a human being is that we experience life as a theater and that that shapes our reality. And it's not just a theater and what's going on on stage, Mm -hmm. There are people, specific people who are emblematic of subcultures that are audiences to certain things that happen in our life. And that's mm -hmm. where our shame comes from. Mm -hmm. So it might not even be that anybody saw you not do this, but there's a man living within your head that's like, that makes you not a real man. Let's look at another one of your TikToks to get a deeper understanding of what you mean. My rants on masculinity. I am showing this picture of myself, A, to show off, B, because men who identify as masculine will reflexively reject any position held by someone who doesn't have a masculine aesthetic. Now, masculinity is a type of cultural currency that society tells men they need to hook up with women. They use hooking up with women as a way to win affection from other men, which is kind of gay, literally. Men will do almost anything if you tell them it makes them more masculine, from buying supplements they don't need to kill people they don't know for reasons they don't understand, which makes it a perfect marketing tool to make men fight for ideas that don't serve them. Ever wonder why every racist, sexist, homophobic community places such an emphasis on masculinity? From white supremacists to Muslim extremists, they all want to play dress up and play man. Simplistic narratives of us good, them bad, and never changing your opinion is rewarded as a masculine trait, which makes you a good little servant to the power structures you grew up in as they feed you lines about you being a free thinker, but tell me, what free thinker can't dress, talk, love, or believe what they want? Oh yeah, a really masculine one. I have a joke where I was like, the gayest thing I ever did was have sex with lots of women because I was doing it to impress other guys. Mm. The entire outfit, I was hooking up with women to get validation from my best friend. Mm. And the the reality of it is, if the the concept of other male's approval more than what you care about, that's part of the male gaze within you. And it's subcultural, but it is that viewing of yourself from the outside and from another right. man's perspective. 
The male gaze, and, and let me be very clear on something. When I say the male gaze, I'm not saying any one man in particular, right? I'm not dehumanizing men or saying men are exactly the problem, but this overarching thematic construct of the male gaze and sort of, it's an ideology, right? Of mm -hmm. seeing people through a certain lens. So it affects people of all genders. And I wonder, you know, in addition to on TV and, and film, where else do you, did you personally, or where else do you think other men kind of internalize this male gaze and this idea for how they should be? Sports. In sports, you're spending so much time with these people. Their opinion matters to you. Women are a focus of discussion because you guys maybe don't have that much in common besides the sport. And that creates a standard of what a man is supposed to be because you will have guys who are within the sports team who are hyper successful with women. Your, their opinion matters to you because you see them as being hyper competent. And so that's where I, that's where I kind of see it very strong where like mm -hmm. a, a lot of these games of like, oh, like what would other guys think? How do, oh, like, you know, just flex in front of her, send mm -hmm. her this, oh, all girls care about is money. And also because the Brody atmosphere is anti-intellectual a lot of times. So you're not mm -hmm. going to have a lot of guys being like, oh, because even caring about how a woman receives reality is mm -hmm. perceived as feminine. Right. And, right. And, and they will pair that as being not good with women. So that, mm. I think that's one of the spaces where it starts is that kind of bro culture, frat culture has its mm -hmm. own male gaze. I think anywhere where there's a tribe of men mm. built around simultaneously obsessed with women, but in a space that excludes women. You've used the word tribe a few times. And I think one of the things that is so powerful about misogyny in general is it does really create a sense of inclusion by mm -hmm. means of exclusion, right? I fit into this group because I'm not like this other group. And hearing you use the words disposable, I think disposable was the word you used when it came to sort of the, the, the currency of men mm -hmm. for society. Um, that really lands for me in a way that I've never heard it put before. So if, if there's an idea of I'm disposable, then it really is a, an inherent existential and, and biological imperative to feel a sense of belonging with the people you're going to go down in flames with, i.e. other men, right? And if you are conditioned to feel like your survival depends on your inclusion in this group of men, then it makes it really challenging to step outside of these um, scripts that you're given, right? These ways of interacting and challenge the norm. Because if you land yourself on the outs, right? In this other, in this group of men that you're with, you might not survive to see the light of day tomorrow. And who's going to take care of you if you get injured or, or really left behind in, a, in an egregious way? I love how you connected the dots with that because it's, it's one of the most, I think one of the biggest struggles for modern men, the reason why suicide rates are going up mm -hmm. um, and depression, men don't feel like they matter a lot of times. Now there's mm -hmm. a, we've, a lot of things that work well and, and the, the patriarchy is terrible, but the problem that a lot of men have is, is they have no evidence that anyone in the world cares about them. And that is, so I, I feel like a lot of women's problems come from the fact that there is an impossibility of being anonymous as a woman, mm. whether you're playing video games online and getting harassed, whether it's just wanting to walk <laughs> at, alone at night, mm -hmm. there, th th that is baked into every part of it is women are basically born famous and have to deal with that with none of the actual real Works. benefits and a lot, <laughs> of the, a lot of the dangers. Yeah. Men's side is the opposite, is that most of society is built to keep you out. Mm. You're, they don't want you in clubs anywhere. No one invites you places. The, the, one, the one person that's probably going to see value in you are two exploitative people, which are your coach, if, you, if you're muscular and big, and mm. your recruiter, if your grades were bad. Mm. And so there's a lot of guys who they're missing the boat. They're not getting any validation that they matter. And there's something unique in this prism that you don't really have value unless you're desired. So Lacan talks about um, mm. the, the we, we desire, so we, we desire to desire, right? And mm -hmm. that that splinters the self, but what ends up happening, and this is, this is my own writing on desire, mm -hmm. is that when you pick somebody who, who basically, um, that a crush that you have, 
they become your standard for mattering because mm -hmm. they matter so much to you. Your consciousness is like the way that I can prove to myself that I matter is, is if they, they like me back, if yeah. they desire me in this very specific yeah. way. Of course. And men and uh, women, what ends up happening is the standard keeps going up. Mm -hmm. And then it's not just, oh, whether or not they kissed me, it's whether or not they would want to have the type of relationship that I want with them. Mm -hmm. And anything that falls short of that means you don't matter. And for guys, it, it might it might not get as far as that person ever even noticing that they exist, but mm -hmm. getting any evidence of the opposite can make their entire world implode. And we don't have a very, we don't, a lot of times we don't have a vocabulary for this, mm -hmm. right? That feeling of worthlessness in the face of, of the overwhelming desire that you can feel in the direction of somebody else and that splintering of the self. And um, you just said something so important, right? There's not a vocabulary that men are given to process these feelings. And I think a big part of that is because they're often socialized away from any emotions that are more complex um, mm -hmm. and dimensional other than things like happiness, pride, and anger, right? Yeah. Those are sort of the sanctioned emotions that men can express without running the risk of losing their identity as a man. Mm -hmm. And so when, when there isn't an, a more robust vocabulary and uh, awareness of what those other feelings really are and what they're called and how to express them, let alone to, to be accepted in their expression, it really, I think, has left men with um, a, a lot of pain that they don't know what to do with. And so what, what often happens then is we want to annihilate the thing that evokes pain, but mm -hmm. we're misidentifying the target. Right. A lot of men will see the women who don't um, appreciate them or desire them in the way that they want as being the source of their pain. But I think that it's a, a larger and more ab abstract target in that it's really sort of this patriarchal system of masculinity that mm -hmm. says you're not good enough unless dot, dot, dot. And so women become sort of a, a chess piece mm -hmm. in the psychodrama of feeling man enough. And it's not really about the particular woman. You know, she oh. she could be person A, person B, person C, but for whatever reason, there's been a lot of value assigned to who she is in a need to have that reflected back. I love what you said about the annihilation. You see with the, with the shooting we just had in Atlanta, right? Where mm -hmm. there's a very unsophisticated way of solving that issue. So many guys, they operate from the assumption that women's attraction is a choice. I think the reason why this is the case is for guys, it's like, well, I can't help if I can't get hard, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not attracted. But for guys who don't understand women, they're like, well, why couldn't you? It's just, you know, just why, why can't you let me in? Right. And, that, and that misunderstanding that a girl's not, people are not in control of their attraction. It is something that happens in spite of us. That's mm -hmm. why I feel so magical. That's why there's a gravity about it. And this mm. misunderstanding that I think, oh, a girl in a movie kind of didn't like him, but then he did something cool at a dinner and now she is attracted to him seems so arbitrary, mm -hmm. right? But there is no care um, with showing, yeah, why she began, began sawing him in a different light. There's no, oh, he created an emotional experience with her right. that made him more relevant. It's none of that. It is, oh, I have achieved this status thing, which made her more interested when it could have mm -hmm. just been like, actually, your speech really made her feel understood in a way and mm -hmm. made her see you in a light that was more dimensional. And yeah. she fell away from the concept of the type that she had to accept you maybe in a romantic light. That's completely different. This is one of the, the biggest points about the male gaze that I that I um, have a problem with because it paints everybody in this one dimensional sort of one note stroke. And it doesn't really fully elucidate the meaning that we attach to different things. So using your example, right? Let's say a person was trying, a man was trying to get the attention of a woman he thought was amazing. And so he gave a really meaningful speech. Whether or not it was even meaningful to him, we don't know. But the meaning she took from it 
in this, mm -hmm. in this, you know, scenario, maybe it gave her a sense of seeing him as someone she could be safe with, or maybe it mm -hmm. gave her a sense of seeing him as an adventurer or a pioneer in whatever he was speaking about. And that meaning that she attaches to that behavioral demonstration is what actually is the shift. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. just the behavior. If he gave a really passionate speech about auto mechanics and she didn't care at all about that and had no meaning to attach to it, then his effort would fall flat. But if he gave a, a powerful speech about something related to, I mean, I don't even know, like pick a topic, or painting, right? And that happened to hit home with her, then, then there's the connection. It's not the behavior, it's the meaning that we attach to it that often creates connection opportunities and attraction opportunities when there weren't any, when we see each other as these one or two dimensional tropes running around. And I think specifically for minority men in the male gaze is that they don't feel like they participate. So for a lot of Indian guys, it's like, I, I don't even exist in these. In, I don't exist in Western art. Hmm. So, and if I do exist in Western art is that's a joke for not being masculine. Hmm. So then there is a space where it's like, who am I supposed to be in this entire where's my position yeah. in society yeah where's my and that there's a lot of pain there because they feel this consequence so one of the things whenever you're teaching a guy um they have all these insecurities and some of them are founded in reality some of them are not mm -hmm. um but a lot of the things is like they think that like oh my race is the reason why this person didn't like me and it might, let's say it was like 10% of the pie, right? Like people have preferences, et cetera. But this person isn't focusing on like the 90% of other things of how mm -hmm. her experience was affected by by his presence. Mm -hmm. And they fixate on the, the immutable, right? Yeah. And that yeah. absolves them of responsibility. And I think that's easier to do when you've never seen a version of you be successful with women mm -hmm. on the big screen. And so you're like, this. these stories aren't even for me. This yeah. gaze isn't even told with me and I. Exactly. And, and I feel like everybody else got the blueprint. And so I think that there, there's a lot of struggling with that. And when people ask me, what's a good movie that doesn't have the male gaze? I was like, uh, before sunset. Oh, that is an excellent example. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's because Julie Delphi wrote, mm -hmm. wrote the script. She, mm -hmm. they literally, they sat there and they wrote, it felt so real and authentic. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't even a need for, kiss. and you, there was no kiss scene, mm -hmm. sex scene, but you felt it. Yep. And you, you felt, felt that you, heat. You felt that heat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You felt that the, the, the subtext of it, that there was a real connection that mm -hmm. both of them had. And, yeah. and it was all, and this is what I think is the biggest difference between the male gaze and the female gaze. The mm -hmm. male gaze is explicit. It's kind of salesy. What would be one, two, three questions that you could leave for men to think about internally mm -hmm you know, as, as they're watching TV, as they're looking at movies, as they are engaging with people in life to help them recognize when they might be seeing things from the lens of the male gaze and what should they do with that information? That, that, that's a really great question. I think the first question would be, does this woman feel like she has wants independent of this man in this movie hmm. does, does she feel like she actually exists um and the reason i say that in like 500 days of summer summer doesn't actually exist mm -hmm. you don't know you literally know nothing about summer yep. because it's told from tom's point of view yep. and even though it's a movie that's made as a critique you still see the flattening of her character mm -hmm. right is, is she is she three-dimensional and ask yourself where have i done that to a girl that i thought i've loved hmm where have I flattened somebody to make them more convenient for me? Mm. Oh, that's a really great question. How have I refused to see their dimensions so that exactly. they fit into the role of what my needs are and how they can meet them? Exactly. The story that I want for them in my life. Yeah. And um, I think second, this, is, this isn't about a particular piece of media, but it is about asking who wrote this mm -hmm. and who produced this. Mm. And I think that's important because it affects the amount of weight you can give it at being declarative about reality, mm. right? 
if you're saying, if you're like, oh, women are like this, but it was written and directed by Quentin Tarantino, and <laughs> you, you're trying to navigate reality as a Quentin Tarantino star, that's actually going to, have, that maybe you're gonna have limited success. And I, th I think the third one is, who would my who would my younger sister or older sister be in this movie? Mm. Oh, I love that question. That really brings it home. Right, like who, yeah. like, are, are, are she, is she any of these people? What parts are they leaving out? Mm. And um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. That was really insightful. I'm so grateful for everything that you brought to this conversation and really for sharing um, some of your own experience. You know, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a wonderful time. This, you're such an amazing interviewer. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you. For people who want to check out your work, where can they find you? Um, you can find me at Bill Batit on TikTok okay. or Batit on Instagram. And, okay. Yeah. Great. And oh, Great. actually, this will be live, but you, you'll find it over there. I have a thing called the Praxis Portal, um, which is basically a, a paywall version of like, hundreds of my writing and, and, and audio commentary about people, media, um, current events, all these other things. And it's like, I think it's gonna be like $4, 30 cents a month. That's amazing. Okay, great. So I'll put all of that in the show notes for people to check out so they can find you. And thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Modern Intimacy. Follow our show on your favorite podcast app by going to modernintimacy.com slash podcast. And while you're there, don't forget to enter in a question or a topic idea for future episodes. That's modernintimacy.com slash podcast. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not a substitute for therapy or psychiatric care. Listening to this show or submitting questions or topic ideas does not constitute a therapeutic or professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or any providers that work at Modern Intimacy. If you're having a medical or psychiatric emergency, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are those of the guests only and are not necessarily indicative of those opinions held by Dr. Kate Balistrieri or staff at Modern Intimacy. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more episode information and helpful tips, visit modernintimacy.com or follow us on Instagram at The Modern Intimacy or follow Dr. Kate on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrieri. See you next week.